Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode in the series where I interview a master's student in psychology. So in today's episode specifically we are speaking to Gomez who is currently a clinical psychology master's student. He is currently doing his internship and has kindly availed some time to answer some questions. So as always there will be timestamps in the description box and I have also left his email in the comments section down below so if you need to know anything you can ask him and yeah just pay attention to the timestamps if you want to know anything specific but this of course is a really long video i understand that you might not want to watch all of it but i highly suggest that you do so without further ado let's get into the video okay so gomez please introduce yourself to youtube just tell them what you're studying where you're studying and anything else you'd like them to know okay uh good Okay, I don't want to say morning because it's going to be on the internet, so good whatever time you're watching this. Good morning, afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Gomez. I am a student clinical psychologist, or rather now an intern clinical psychologist. I studied at UJ, University of Johannesburg. I did my M1 in 2020. Sorry, I keep losing track of the years. And um, I'm currently doing my internship, which I'm set to begin shortly which is abnormal in a lot of ways because I should have begun in January, but those are some issues I can get into later in this segment if asked. Anything interesting? Huh. Um, it feels like one of those tell us something special about yourself segments that I'm never really sure what to say. Like, what special yeah, talent you're can like, I who am I? <laughs> you know, like, what can I say that people would consider cool? Um, anything interesting? Jeez, can I forfeit this one for now? Like, if, if something comes up later, I'll, I'll, I'll be like, ooh, addendum. <laughs> okay, no problem then. Okay, we'll just get into the first question then. How long did it take for you to get into the clinical psychology program after completing your honors slash B psych? Huh, okay, well, I was a little fortunate because I got in first time trying. You but, uh... as well! what it it didn't take me uh multiple attempts because i got i got very lucky if i'm being honest but my journey through psychology was also a little was a little different right because i didn't follow the typical path followed in south africa because i okay i'm foreign so i actually completed my undergrad somewhere else so um can you elaborate on that like where you completed it yeah. and where you're from i Okay, I'm from Malawi, so um, which is a, a lot of people surprisingly don't know this place. It is a small country right there in like the corner of Sadek, bordering Mozambique and Zimbabwe and Zambia. Um, I did my undergrad at the University of Namibia, where I completed a B psych. Right, so it was a full four-year program, and going into it, I then did an internship for two years at a psychiatric hospital there. Um, it's called Okongwari Psychotherapeutic Center. So then, after that, what then got me a little fortunate in my psychology journey was that the supervisor that I had sort of became a mentor, and I think she's part of she's a big part of the reason why I got in first time out because she was really coaching me through it. So what I then did was, after working for two years as a counselor, I then came to South Africa and completed a second honors. Um, the reason for that was because the BSEC is a very practical degree, so there wasn't a lot of, how do I phrase this, like there wasn't, there wasn't like any research content apart from theoretical. Like you, we did a research module, of course, but I didn't actually do any research. I did a practicum. Mm. And I was worried about coming into master's with that little lack. It's like, I have no idea what I'm doing in terms of research. I can, I might pass an exam, but will I actually be able to do anything? So I did a second honors and I did it at UJ. So part of the strategy for me was wherever I do my honors, I should then, you know, do a little politicking where I chummy up with the department, get to understand what it's like, um, the culture of the institution. And lucky enough that it honestly worked for me because where I did my honors, UJ is where I got in. So this was one of those things or one of those situations, uh, as people like to say, where it was honestly, you only ever need one. So I say that because 
UJ was literally the only place where I got invited for selection week because I I applied at UJ Rhodes and uh, University of Limpopo, which if I'm being honest was uh, a last minute addition for me. So I'm not surprised to say no. I think my application was very rushed, but um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I applied to those three universities. I only got invited to selection week for one, and fortunately they they liked me um so yeah that was my journey into it where it was sort of fortunate to have met someone who could guide me through the process the mentor i mentioned earlier because she would she would like advise me in a lot of ways she did her um she did her m1 at nelson mandela university i think they changed Mm -hmm. their name now i'm not sure um but yeah when she was there she said it was called an nmmu Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University. So she did it there and she would really just walk me through the process in terms of, you know, this is what they'd be assessing at this time. Try and um, work on this part of your, should I say, your skill set. Try and ensure that you interact in this way because that then might help you be authentic, you know, the usual advice that everyone always says. So she was, yeah, she, yeah. she was very helpful through that process. That's so nice. And everyone that I've spoken to, I've interviewed two people so far, and they also got in on their first attempt. And I'm like, what is going on here? Like, how? How even? So that's really, it's really rare because I have met so many people who have been rejected like up to five times for the clinical psychology program. Because I think clinical psychology is the most difficult one because so many people apply for it, like hundreds of people every single year. And it is so ridiculously competitive. So I didn't expect you to say that you actually got in on the first time because I just know people who have been rejected like up to five times. So really rare that you get in the first time, but at least you had a mentor. So that's really nice. Yeah, no, I've heard I've heard a lot of the horror stories because I think there was um, one of the people that I completed the master's program with last year. But I think she was not, not a thing. Sorry, she was doing counseling. And she said it took her up to seven attempts. So it's, I think everyone's journey is a little different, but yeah, I know. I think I was a little fortunate to to get it first time out. I was like, oh, okay. That's the understatement of the century. A little fortunate, like you're living people's dreams by getting in the first time. What can I say? I appreciate it. (laughs) And then the second question is, how did you find the selection process itself? You said you just interviewed at UJ, so just take us through how you found that selection process itself. Terrible. One of the worst things I've ever put myself (laughs) through. It was filled and riddled with anxiety at every single corner and setup available. I mean, my goodness. Um... (laughs) Okay, now that I got that out there, I feel like anytime someone asks me about Selection Week, I need to vent first. It's just like, oh my God, why'd they have to put me through that? You kind of get PTSD, you get those flashbacks, you're like, oh no. No, like, they hit you like this massive wave because I don't think anything has ever triggered as much anxiety for me as Selection Week. It was, Mm -hmm. it spanned four days and I did it 2019, so right before the COVID wave. So I had face-to-face interviews. Um... It was nerve wracking because you go into the hall, they, they have you set up in this class with everyone just sitting there together and you're obviously all looking at each other like, oh my goodness, you guys are so cool. But at the same time, I totally hope I get the spot over you. And, <laughs> and then they, they announced, like, we're going to have a few activities. There's uh, only going to be cuts from day two. So I think that was uh, something that kind of eased the pressure a little bit. I was like, no, cuts will only start day two. So I was like, oh, okay, cool. Let's get to know each other. And then from there, it was just like, yeah, but once cuts start, cuts really start. Because I think on that day too, they cut half. It was just like, mm. what? <laughs> How many are gone? <laughs> and then day three to day four, they cut half again. It was just like, you, you're you not slowing down? No, you don't You don't need time to consider your options? No? Okay. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> it's very cutthroat. Yeah, no, so it was very, it was filled with a lot of anxiety because... A lot of the time, I think the one thing that I always heard was like, how can I present myself in a way that's like, you know, impressive to them? And the truth is... The best version of you. Yeah, the truth is you never know. Because 
I think one of the things I've really realized is that selection week is filled, riddled with so much anxiety that honestly, any performance that you put on is, it's not going to stick, right? So if you are presenting, should I say, the best version of yourself, and that version is not consistently presenting during selection week, because, you know, at some point, anxiety kicks in, and they notice inconsistency in your presentation, it's not going to look well. You know, like it's not going to be perceived well by them. So then it becomes this thing where it's like everyone's just like, oh, just be yourself. Oh, just be yourself. Oh, just be yourself. Which I came to learn is just be authentic. If you're selected, you're selected. If you're not, you're not. Uh, the truth is you're going to spend that entire week negotiating so much anxiety and negotiating some really challenging uh, material during selection week because, you know, there's... Um, that obviously I can't go into too much detail, but there's like, there's the research activity, which is going to require you to think a little bit, you know, there is a group mm. process usually for most universities, which, um, really brings out how you interact in a group dynamic, you know, they, there's the personal interviews that they have with you, they're facing the panel, you're going to be negotiating all of that anxiety and trying to negotiate all the answers, uh, the uh, answers to the questions they're asking you, which sometimes requires a lot of insight. Sometimes it just requires a lot of thought and analysis. You're not going to have the cognitive or emotional capacity to really be thinking about keeping a presentation going. So it's, yeah, my experience of it was terrible. Anxiety was so real. But yeah. yeah, I remember the, there was a time um, where I got home and yeah. waiting for that email to see if I made it to the next day or not. I was shaking the whole day. I couldn't do anything. I was like, watch something to distract yourself. Nope. Can't focus. My mind is... What's going to happen? It's, it wasn't just my mind. It felt like my soul was shaken. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm in the middle of them right now and that's how... That's exactly how I feel like that anxiety is just through the roof that waiting for that email. It's just it's absolutely dreadful. And there's absolutely nothing that anybody can even say to you or do that will make you feel better because you literally can't even get your mind off of that at all. Yeah, so it's like you spend so much time negotiating that it's really hard. And I keep repeating negotiating because I'm like, I don't know what else we can call that. I don't, I don't know if I can say I was successfully managing my anxiety or any other feeling of stress that came on from that experience. I would say I was honestly just negotiating it. Maybe managing falls under that blanket <laughs> experience. Yeah, like just doing what you can to just get by. Like nobody's trying to even be happy. You're just trying to be fine. That's all. So thank you for that insight. I think a lot of people get like this unrealistic expectation of what it's going to be like even though everybody says that it's terrible like you always think oh no i'm gonna prepare and i'm gonna be fine but honestly no matter how much preparation you do <laughs> it's never going to be enough because of those thoughts afterwards like oh did they like me am i gonna get through how did the other candidates do like so many things go through your mind so at least we're giving people a realistic expectation of what it is going to be like so thank you for answering that so honestly and then the next question is tell us about the clinical psychology field and one thing that is unique to it oh clinical psychology field i i think this is one of those things coming in for me where i've been learning a lot about clinical psychology because i think um coming in i honestly used to conflate a lot of um everything um specifically between clinical and counseling it was like oh we're doing similar things um let's just go in let's just learn and then you know you start getting into the specialization you start understanding why things are different you know um what's the real difference between psychology and psychiatry uh psychology and social work and all of that like where do they really start blending and where do they start separating and individuating from one another so i think um, when it comes to clinical psychology, my understanding of it has really just come into the population of people that you're working with because you are then often in clinical settings. You will often work in hospital settings uh, primarily, or at least if you're in public. If you're in private, you might then work in private practice um, and that sort of stuff. But to be honest, I would 
high key advice, especially early in the career, that you do work in a hospital setting, just so you're exposed to a wider variety of of cases. So I think something that's unique to psychology for me is then naturally the nature of the work that you're going to do, um, simply because of the spaces that you're in. There will be differences between um, conducting psychotherapy either in a hospital setting and conducting psychotherapy in a private practice setting, you know, where you're, you're set up there. So that's, that's the uniqueness to me, the, the differences that come with that. Because if you're in a hospital setting, for example, you're then part of a system. And the way you're working within that system, it's going to be different. Like if you're working at, let's say, Helen Joseph Hospital, or you're working at um, Sturkfontein, which is a psychiatric hospital, you know, it's, it's going to have... Uh, a few differences in terms of how you're interacting with it. It's uh, the process that you have to go through, the procedure that comes with that. And also then if you're working in private practice and how you're sort of just working on your own. So I think that's one of the unique things that I've come to see for myself. And I think I find clinical work particularly, what's the right word? Rewarding. I find it very reward rewarding. That's something that's really stuck out for me. When you, you come to someone who's come to the hospital and they're desperately seeking help. And it's sort of like, I don't know what to do. I'm overwhelmed. You know, that's the story that you often hear. And the, that's why I'm here. I tried to do this on my own. It wasn't helping before. And now I desperately need assistance. And just walking with them through that journey from perhaps a feeling of helplessness for them to a place where they start feeling healthier, or better, better able to respond to the community around them, I think... That, for me, has been a very rewarding process. So I'm not sure if I answered this question accurately, but yeah, that's sort of what stood out for me in this journey. You know, I think you did. I just, you know, this question was more of like, for somebody who's not sure what kind of, what type of psychology they even want to choose. You know, a lot of people just think that clinical is like the pinnacle of you know psychology and i don't know where we even got this assumption from but i just wanted to you know get your understanding of it because a lot of people think okay clinical is the pinnacle of it but then it might not be suitable for you like for what you want and what you are interested in like you know the severe pathology and the like super severe cases and things like that a lot of people don't understand how like as rewarding as it is it can also be very draining and not everybody is I just want people to think properly before they choose their field of specialization and not just go because, you know, just go for clinical because it's the best one or it's, you know, highly coveted and whatnot. I just wanted to get your perspective on what you think clinical is and what kind of person would be suitable for clinical or what kind of person would enjoy clinical. You know what I mean? Oh, okay. Let me answer that one directly because that's actually a really good question. I think... How do I articulate this the best way? If you're going into clinical psychology, I think you need to be comfortable uh, sitting with, as you mentioned, the intense psychopathology, you know, because it's like the cases that come to you, you're going to be facing um, stories filled with extreme pain, with extreme adversity. A lot of the times you're not really going to be interacting with stories where things may have you know, like they may have been tough for a while and then they got better somewhere along the way. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be very intense stories and sitting with that can be very difficult. I, I can't tell you how many times I've sat with a client's story and I'm just completely overwhelmed and I don't know how to negotiate that. And it's just, sure. <laughs> you know, um, how do I even make meaning of this, especially when you're new, you know? So if you're going into clinical, it is going to be a challenging experience um, because of the cases that you're working in, with. Now, that's not to say that counseling, for example, is not challenging. It's very challenging, and you're going to be exposed to very intense cases as well. But the nature of the cases is going to be slightly different. One of the things I've come to understand as one of the key differences between the two is that, you know, with counseling, you're, you're then more community-based in in the sort of cases that you're going to um, be interacting with you know and then with clinical you're then fully clinically based 
So depending on what sort of exposure you want, I think that's then going to work better for you. And not just the exposure that you want, but the exposure that you're better at negotiating and dealing with. If you want the sort of experience where you're working uh, primarily in the community and you're interacting with people in terms of the challenges that they face um, as members of the community, it's going to be far more rewarding for you if you choose community um, counseling. I think VITS actually even calls it community-based counseling uh, program. And then if you enjoy dealing on, okay, I'll be honest, there's some that do enjoy dealing with the severe um, psychopathology and they find clinical settings far more rewarding or they find clinical settings, you know, far more adept to their skill set. Then that's something yeah. you're going to enjoy far more as well. Because also with uh, clinical patients, you're also going to be dealing a lot with, for example, there's going to be a lot of games <laughs> during the therapy process. <laughs> and what okay. I mean by that is the patient might not actually always, like they might be playing a game with you a lot of the times. So with clinical counseling, um, with clinical therapy, sorry, it's not always going to be straightforward. You do need to be able yeah. to negotiate those games um, some, some might even call it a little bit of manipulation that comes with being a therapist in that setting. So I would say really consider what skill set you have, what sort of exposure you want, where you primarily want to be set up. Um, as I mentioned, if you're in clinical like I am, at some point you should work in the hospital setting just to get that exposure. If you're not, counseling is also a very rewarding experience and I think that's going to be really dope for you. Yeah. I just wanted to, you know, get your perspective because I think a lot of people glamorize like the severe pathology because they read about it in books and it's so interesting. But the problem is it's just in a book. It's not an actual person sitting in front of you. And I think a lot of people might actually be very shocked by that experience. And I think I got a, a little taste of that during my role plays with you know, the selection week, I was like, oh my goodness, it's actually happening now. And that transition is actually, it's very difficult. It's more difficult than people expect. And I just wanted people to think very carefully, like, are you just interesting, interested in studying the pathology or are you, do you actually want to work with a person who has that pathology? And, you know, the chances of them getting better might not be as high as you wanted it to be, or as you thought it would be. So, you know, there's a, difference or maybe you can you know agree or disagree or add something like what you see on paper when you learn the dsm and all of the pathology and all of those things and what you actually experience when you actually are speaking to a person with it is it very different or how did you like find that transition oh it's very different <laughs> i think um, yeah, as you mentioned, it it has been glamorized in a lot of ways where it's sort of like, oh, yeah, no, um, depression is fashionable. You know, having depression or addiction is edgy or whatever. You know, it's it's one of those things that's become a plot point in a story. Um, <clears throat> and I'll admit myself, it's something that I fell into as well because I remember growing up, I enjoyed, um, what was that show? What was that show? Looking back, it was very toxic. Um <laughs> Vampire Diaries. Uh, I really used to enjoy Vampire Diaries. And I enjoyed the concept of being a character like Damon Salvatore, who was uh, considered to be very cool, very edgy, very, you know, mysterious. But at the same time, a lot of people would be like, he's also very, I don't want to use the word damaged, but um, the way he interacts and relates to other people is not always the healthiest. You know, <laughs> so it would be like, oh, let me also have that experience because people seem to enjoy relating to guys like that. And it's cool. And I try yeah, to he's a bad boy. You know, it was like, <laughs> let me let me also do that. Let me have that sort of experience. Because then it becomes like, oh, yeah, character development. Right. Because that's how it's presented in TV shows. The the mental illness or whatever this is. It's, it's just character development. The truth is, it's so misrepresented. It's, so it's, it's, it's not even realistic most of the time. Yeah, so it's like in real life, it's a completely different presentation because it's not it's not just character development that pathology is rooted in someone's suffering, hmm. right? Hmm. It's rooted in someone's pain, whether it's emotional pain or um, sometimes even physical pain, which manifests psychologically to some extent. Um, and I, what I mean by that is. It's going to be something 
which started from a physical experience in the in in their lives. You know, perhaps they they went through an experience that was truly just utterly traumatizing. And they struggle to really sit with that. And it could be um I don't want to go into examples because I really don't feel this is the best place to start diving in. Yeah, no, you don't have to do that. Don't worry. It's just to answer the question like, and to make people think very carefully before they, not to put them off from clinical, but just to make them think very carefully before considering it just because it's seen as, you know, the best type of psychology or whatever other assumptions are out there. Yeah. I think the way I always look at it is, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, it's that, it's that experience of it being rooted in that person's suffering where it's like, the moment you're exposed to it, it can feel heavy. It can mm. feel very heavy. Mm. Uh, there are days where I come home and I honestly barely even have the capacity left for myself in terms of just to emotionally be there for myself or to cognitively be there for myself and make time for myself. It's, I struggle. Um, I'm often told that's because I'm new. And I still need to develop that skill set, you know, but in a lot of ways, I look at it and, and it's because, you know, when, when you see someone going through something like that, when you, ex when they share that experience with you, it can sit with you in a lot of ways and it can be very, very heavy. So that's something you need to be prepared for coming in sitting with those intense experiences of emotional pain and suffering and walking with that person through that journey without necessarily taking on, should I say, the responsibility of then healing the person because then it's a process and you can't come in and just fix them. Yeah, and it has to be at their own pace, not what you, like how fast you want them to progress. Yeah, so that's... I think that's something that's really stood out for me, particularly early on in my career. Okay, thank you for highlighting that. I think that the, you know, this conversation that we're having is very necessary because this is not what you hear in, or what you see in the brochures and what is mentioned to people. It's something that you can honestly only experience or learn once you are in the process. And that's why I wanted to make these videos because not a lot of people know many master's students and they don't get to actually have a full understanding of what it is like to actually be in the program because everyone's like okay i just need to get in i need to get in but then once you get in what happens from there so that's really the purpose of this series so thank you for answering that so well so let's just move on to the next question what is a week in your life like while doing this degree i think you can answer more to the m1 aspect of your degree like what was a week in your life like Cool. Now, actually, with the, uh, uh, I think I'll be able to answer both. Um, listen. <laughs> Whew. Sorry, I had to laugh for this one for a bit because, you know, Masters is going to completely take over your life. Okay? Um, hobbies, interests, all of that stuff, it's important. And this is weird because everyone's always like, it's important to keep that in your life. Yes, it's very true. It's very important to keep that in your life. Will you be able to do it, though? That's a whole other conversation. <laughs> My friends are always making this joke of how unavailable I've become lately. Not even just my friend, my family. My mother would be like, where's my son? I haven't talked to him in months. <laughs> like, there are times where I'll completely just vanish. And it's like, where's Gomez? And I'm just like, guys, uh, I'm sorry. It's, it's just I either don't have the time or I don't have the capacity to have a conversation with you after all of this. Because it's either I'm busy or I'm recovering from being busy. You know, so like, yeah, uh, a, a week in my life is filled with, let's start with M1. Um, M1 was filled with a lot of seminars and those seminars lasted for all or most of the day, right? Um, the shortest one would have was from nine and this is UJ's schedule specifically. So other universities might be very different. UJ might have also changed it already by now. I'm not sure if it's still the same because they, they do revise the program every year just uh, uh, based on what worked, what didn't, how did we experience this year with these students, with this intake. Yeah, how to keep it current. Yeah, and where to improve, you know, that kind of stuff. So like, for example, I had the shortest seminars we had were from like nine to one. Um, a lot of them would go from like nine to three and others from nine to four. 
It's like a full working oh, day. Yeah. <laughs> it's a full working day. So um, that's why a lot of the times I'd always be like, no, you can't do masters and have another job, right? Because M1 specifically, you are then experiencing coursework, right? Which is the seminars I'm talking about. You're attending classes, you're, you're learning, which as you know, uh, attending classes comes with all the other lovely stuff tests, assessments, presentations. You're going to do a lot of presentations. Um, there's also probably going to be a lot of group work, right? So you're not going to have a lot of time outside of that alone. Now to add on to that, you're also doing practicals because they do need to start exposing you to some capacity. Our practicals were once a week, right? So every Friday we're at the hospital and we were seeing patients actively. Now, because we were still student psychologists at that time, we're then seeing, um, should, should I say the, the simpler, less complicated cases or the less severe cases, the cases with a less severe presentation. I think that's a better way to, to phrase that. Um, simply because, you know, those cases are, um, they're easier to manage and therefore better for someone to learn than to just say, oh, okay, you just started your here, student psychologist journey. Here are the most severe presentations in the Yeah, they don't want to throw you in the deep end. They don't want to throw you in the deep end. It's like, okay, let's introduce you. Let's give you perhaps a mild case of depression. See how you treat this case. So you, you're, you're going to have practicals every week, which means you're then also going to have supervision every week. Supervision is on two levels. You have supervision from the university where there's a lecturer who's teaching you um, the theory and the practical and everything. And then you're going to have supervision at the hospital because they also need to ensure that you are then um, managing the case well, making sure their patients are receiving adequate care and how you're adjusting to being in the hospital, ETC. So you can really see how time starts to stretch very thin over there. Um, and then there's all the stuff that comes with seeing patients you're writing notes you're writing reports you are um recovering <laughs> let's <laughs> let's not forget the time needed for recovery so there's that as well right and you're negotiating all of this during the same time and space right and then let's not forget let's not forget the thing lurking in the background research <laughs> You have a research project. That, Everyone's best friend. Ha! <laughs> ah, research has been a demon in my life. I love it. It's so rewarding. It's amazing. But my God, the stress. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I'm not gonna. It's not one of those things where it's like, oh no, everything is so difficult. You can't do it. Um, the truth is, these are all very manageable tasks, and I think you most do have the capacity to do it it's manageable work the issue comes in doing it all simultaneously because this is all happening in the here and now it's not like you're gonna have time for research here time for coursework here and time for practicals here it's all happening at the same time all right practicals research um coursework you need to negotiate all of that simultaneously so a day uh, a week in my life was filled with all of that um, coursework Monday to Thursday, uh, practicals Fridays, um, reports, ass assessments, all of that obviously happening in that same space, research in that same space. So there were then naturally, just like school is, there'll be times where it's very busy, especially if you are unlucky and a lot of your deadlines kind of collide. You know, um, you have a research deadline with your supervisor, you have, um, a deadline with coursework so the uh, an assessment is due or a presentation is to be prepared and you have a report that's due at the hospital site because you know you're seeing a patient you need to give feedback in the here and now you can't make them wait four months until you have a clear time in your schedule mm. right so all of that's happening all at once it was a very busy very very busy week, weeks as I'm, as I told you, the schedule was Monday to Thursday with the coursework. It was already a full working day, and then the rest is already kind of coming in in the background. In that time, you might then also want to be negotiating uh, family, uh, friends, relationships, hobbies. You might be better than others. I think that's where a lot of some of your skill sets come in. If you're good with time management, you might then be able to negotiate it a little better um you know maintain those relations because you are going to need them 
I'll be honest, you are going to need, you're going to need your friends, you're going to need your family. You're going to need a space where you can go to and not have to do psychology related content just to sort of debunk. No, you need a life outside of it. You need a life outside of it. So yeah, that, that was a, that was a week in my life during M1. And then M2, can you just briefly take us through that? Cause I see we're almost on 40 minutes and we're only on question four out of 14. <laughs> Oh my goodness, I'm over-elaborating. <laughs> Sorry, I tend to do this. Cut me off if you feel I'm taking too long. Okay, M2 is then a full-time job, right? So you are doing internship. So whereas M1, they were slowly introducing you into everything, with M2, it's sort of like, okay, we're no longer slowly introducing you. We need to make sure you're, you're exposed to anything and everything that is available in this field. So you're going to have rotations in the wards. So every single day, you're seeing patients, you're having supervision, you're doing both group and individual therapy. Um, you're writing reports, you're having meetings with your supervisor, sometimes the HOD as well. There's supervisors in the different wards that you're in. It's not like you have, there's one all-encompassing internship or, um, coordinator, but then in the different wards that you're in, you're then also going to in be interacting with different supervisors and doing different work, doing things differently depending on the ward that you're in, right? So it's a full-time job with all the requirements that come with a full-time job. You're working Monday to Friday. You do have working hours. I believe most uh, internships starts at 7.30 in the morning. So you need to be there at 7.30 instead of only waking up at 7.30, <laughs> which is painful for a person like me who's not a morning person, <laughs> all right? Yeah. So yeah, and then on top of that, if you didn't finish research in year one, research comes in there. Um, internship is also filled with seminars, by the way. So there are going to be times where you're learning certain things because they're also teaching you. You're going to have seminars where you're being taught. You're going to have presentations where you have to sort of uh, prepare something and present it to the department. Um, you're yet again, because you're seeing patients all the time, you're writing notes all the time, you're writing reports all the time. Um, let's not forget psychological assessments that kind of stuff so it's it's also very busy since it's a full-time job with the salary that comes with it there is expectation of what you should be able to do and what you should be doing as well yeah you need to apply all of that training from m1 now so yeah thank you for answering that i think you know a lot of people don't understand what you actually do in your master some people think that you know it's just training but they don't realize that you do still do tests and presentations and all of those things so thank you for that and then the next question is what are two pros and two cons of doing the clinical psychology masters two pros um or should i start with the cons Okay, yeah. the cons <laughs> are, the cons are, and I'm not sure this is just specifically for clinical, but just masters overall. The demand in your time is going to be epic and other areas of your life might be affected. Truth is, you might then lose some relationships, especially those that aren't able to sort of sit with you during that process and be like, we're perfectly fine with you disappearing for six months. And, you know, we still feel connected to you your relationships might suffer platonic romantic familial they might they might suffer yeah somebody told me that they call it the divorce court i was like what yeah. <laughs> you know, that's a proven statistic a lot of relationships do not survive um master's programs a lot of that's people insane. come in relationships a lot of people walk out single it's it, it's because of the demand on time it, it takes so mm -hmm. much of you that other aspects of your life will suffer. So that's a clear, that's a clear cut con for me. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Another con is then also the toll that that's going to have on you. Right. And a lot of the times they always do say, then it's like, you should be in therapy during M1 and M2. And I high key advice that you should be in therapy because it might put you in some very, very unhealthy spaces sometimes as you're dealing with all of this stress and anxiety so consistently, you know? So it's, yeah, it's that for me. It's like, you need to learn a lot about emotional well-being. You need to learn a lot about managing your own experiences, ETC. So, um... You can't just talk the talk. <laughs> you gotta walk the walk as well. <laughs> You can't be preaching emotional wellness to people and then yours are yours is a mess. 
<laughs> yeah, so it's like you're gonna, you might even be introduced or you're likely to be introduced to some of the unhealthiest and unpleasant aspects of your own personality and mm. your own presentation. And when you're confronted with that, you then have to negotiate, how am I going to deal with this? Am I going to address it? Am I going to leave it in the background somewhere? Am I going to pretend it doesn't exist? You know, that kind of stuff. Mm. So I think that one can be either a strength or a, a con, depending on how you experience it. Yeah, so those are the two cons for me. The impact on relations and then the impact on the self. Okay, and then the two pros? The two pros, number one, clear cut. It is so rewarding, right? The, the process of working with someone when they come to you in a state of, should I say, suffering, emotional pain, discomfort, and to walk with them through that journey and see how... Um, their health improves that is such rewarding work i honestly have not done much more that i would say yo that like just hits you right here and you're like this was amazing work that felt great it was hard work it put me through so much hell but my god was it <laughs> worth it you know so that's number yeah. one. Number two, and a lot of people also always try to say this, clinical programs, listen guys, the salary is great. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is a career after all, and the career is just as rewarding economically as it is emotionally. So that for me is a, it's a pro. Yeah, you gotta survive through capitalism. What can you, you do? You gotta survive. I'm not gonna be I didn't come in for the money. I did. I did. I, 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 yeah, I came in for all the other lovely stuff, but the money too. You can't deny that, you know, being able to survive financially isn't a pro in this world because the other side of it is not, it's not pretty. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. So those, those are the con those are the pros and the cons for me. <laughs> okay. Thank you for that. And then the next question is what surprised you the most about doing this degree? surprised me the most um to be honest the content didn't really surprise me much it was as i imagine it would be uh, what surprised me the most was me and the different ways it challenged me um and how that difference was with other people because as i mentioned you are going to be exposed to a lot of your weaknesses so how i reacted to certain things i walked in being like i am such a great student i do this so well i'm a b c d uh yeah you know what i'm great and i walk i'm walking in and i'm like yo guys am i gonna pass masters <laughs> it humbled you <laughs> <laughs> it humbled me. So that's the most surprising thing, just how much it humbled me and forced me to take a realistic uh, look into um, what I bring into the room and what it wants from me. So that was easily the most surprising thing, especially when I was coming from an academic background where we're always competing, so we're always worried about grades. It went from, I mm. must pass with distinction until you know what? My certificate is not going to say clinical psychologist with distinction, man. Um, just pass. <laughs> that's enough. <laughs> that's enough. And that switch up mentally for me was very surprising. I think a lot of people, somebody who was a PhD graduate was, you know, talking about how people think that you become more arrogant the more degrees you acquire, but they said it was actually the opposite. Like your master's and your PhD will humble you like no other degree ever will. <laughs> so you don't really come out arrogant. You come out very humble <laughs> and a little bit scarred. <laughs> down to earth i promise you <laughs> yeah okay thank you for that and then the next one is how can one prepare for postgraduate studies in clinical psychology i think there's several ways that you can start preparing if i'm being honest there's several so many um yeah, like outside uh, of the typical just do well in your studies like everybody by now should know that you have to do that for psychology so what can they do outside of that to prepare them I think um, a lot of the difference ends up coming into um, individual qualities, you know, the qualitative stuff, because uh, the degree ends up quantifying your knowledge and your understanding of the theory. And the truth is, after you reach the 65% average, everyone's good. You, you all technically qualify, right? So what really starts shining out is what are the qualitative 
things that you bring into the room. What is your, um, what's your personality like? How do you interact with other people? How do you relate to them? How do you negotiate stress? Um, how do you negotiate difficulties? Uh, that kind of stuff. So I would say, uh, much like earlier, where it's like you go through therapy for the purposes of um, surviving masters. I'd also high key advise going through therapy for the purpose of just understanding yourself and getting more, um, should I say, grounded or getting a deeper understanding of how you relate to the world around you because then that's going to inform how you interact with the process going in. Okay, right. so, so number I one, say... yeah, number one is therapy. Just for everyone oh. watching, you say number one is therapy. Yeah. Number one is therapy. Okay. Go through therapy, learn who you are, learn how you relate to the world. Um, learn what stresses you out, your strengths, your weaknesses, what do you actually need to improve on, and what skill sets do you bring into the room, right? Um, number two, try and get as deep as understanding of the field as possible, because a lot of people do come in blind. They have no idea what to expect. <laughs> You know, and I guess that's where videos like this become really helpful. Do some research, understand what the field is, what is it like in the country at the moment, what are they looking for, what do they need, and how will you fill that, uh, that gap in the industry? Because the whole point of coming in is to take up space within the industry and address a need, right? So that's something that's really going to help. Do your research, learn the industry as, as much as you can with what's whatever is available okay yeah those are the two things i did <laughs> okay and then is that it can we move on to the next one yeah i think we can move on i can't think of anything else at the moment okay and then the next one is do applicants really need to volunteer and how much does it boost their chances of acceptance this one's kind of mixed match. Um, the truth is, I haven't met a lot of people who told me that volunteer experience did much for them. Right? Um, volunteer experience becomes important because it addresses a gap in your, um, in your CV. Potentially. Right? Mm -hmm. And exposure to the field. Uh, but the thing is, it's... I think it becomes more important maybe if it's been a while since you've obtained your honors or whatever and then you're then trying to get in if they're if it's been say three four or five years and they then start asking what have you been doing in that time if you've been doing work in another field that's going to address the gap but if there's been nothing else then they're going to be wondering then what were you doing during that time space and you then need to be able to answer that question right uh yeah. volunteer experience the truth is from my understanding it does help simply because it gets you used to interacting with people but it and it's also going to give you some of those qualitative skills such as you know relating to people um interpersonal skills being able to strike up a conversation and maintain that conversation and those are the ways in which it helps but they're not going to particularly look at someone who's done volunteer work and say oh they have all the skill set that we need because the truth is they are going to teach you that skill set that's why they're there mm. i think it just helps you Sorry, it just helps you stand out when applying because, you know, the minimum requirement is already just the academics in of itself. And if a lot of people meet that, they need to look at other criteria outside of that to start shortlisting people. So I think that is where it does help you. Yes. Um, and whenever you list it, whenever you do list volunteer work, I would also emphasize the skill set that you observed you learned from it. So it... Mm -hmm. You can't just say, I did volunteer work, because then they'll be like, okay, cool. Why is that important to us? Um, mm. Then you start, you, you could list the, the skill set that you got from that. Oh, it improved my interpersonal skills. It improved my um, uh, capacity to do this, to do that, to do that, to do that. And basically quantifying your volunteer experience, that's where that's going to help you. So I would say it's important, but it's not don't root your entire application around it but definitely highlight it in, in key moments yeah you need to mention it in your application some of the universities from what i've seen they actually do ask you 
if you have volunteered and even if they don't ask you just find a way to just mention it briefly because that might be what puts you above somebody else i mean it sounds terrible to say that but that's just the nature of the program and getting shortlisted like you gotta do you gotta like sell yourself basically and volunteer work does it helps with your interpersonal skills but it also helps get your foot in the door when it comes to applications we are competing so i fully understand what you mean you say it's got it's got to, it gives you an edge yeah yeah you, know, you have to remember that at the end of the day so yeah um is that everything for your answer yeah i think that's what stands out for me with volunteer work okay thank you and then somebody else asked would you say that studying psychology isn't just about getting good marks we kind of we kind of discussed this but i'll just give like a very brief answer to that yeah no it's definitely about more than just good grades good grades are important because it determines your ability to negotiate with the theory understand it and apply it right because you you can't apply what you don't understand so they need to see that you have the capacity to understand it and how well you do but after there they start looking at it less and less especially getting into masters i think it's very important academics when you're uh, up until honors right after the honors mark i think um they start looking more at the qualitative stuff because the moment they look at your um application and they look at the grades and like this is important then they'll be like okay cool they meet the minimum requirements let's look at other segments of the application because i know a lot of students who had far higher grades than me academically but weren't invited to selection week because other aspects of the application weren't as strong right mm. so you do need to start valuing those a little more and more because you might then be a very strong academic and grades are very important but those other aspects we've been talking about like interpersonal skills which is very important for our field if we're being honest um interpersonal skills and all of that stuff that starts to carry more weight um mm. but it carries more weight after the academic component is met so it's like still pass still pass very well but um make sure you're developing than m more in more areas than just your grades you're also developing in terms of human skills and i know human skills are hard to quantify <laughs> because we always look at yeah. it as i think industry calls it soft skills or it's like oh what kind of uh dynamic do they bring into the team but you know with psychology they they look at that a little heavier because it's like okay cool we, we've met the criteria what about the other stuff now yeah, I mentioned this in a previous video, but just for the other people who don't watch the other subtypes that I'll be putting out, I said that it puts you, it gets your foot through the door and it yeah. just shows that you have an understanding. And a lot of people seem to think that studying psychology is easy. And to be honest, it is. It is very easy to study it and pass with a 60 or 50 or whatever. What becomes difficult about psychology is constantly getting those 70s 80s and 90s and then also on top of that making sure that you are not just centered in your academics so that you are doing things outside of your academics while getting those marks such as working and volunteering and that is what makes psychology very difficult or more difficult than people expect so i just thought let me put this in this video as well if somebody else hasn't watched those other videos that to me is what psychology and how academics play into it i don't know if you agree yeah. or not I fully agree. I fully agree. Um, I think it also leads back to that comment I made earlier about how master's content in and of itself is not like the most difficult thing. But because of how much you're negotiating in that same time and space, it then becomes very challenging. Because then you have to do this and then you have to do that and you have to do that and you have to do that. And you're balancing four or five different areas of your life and you, you need to maintain every single one of them. It becomes really hard. You know, um, yeah. it requires so much from you your thinking capacity your emotional capacity just to be able to actually invest in what you're doing because it's like if you're investing all of your emotional capacity into school what are your family and friends getting you know what what's your what are your volunteer programs getting yeah what's feeding your soul outside of that like do you do you show up in those spaces present or you just show up because you wanted to mark the box and be like i was here too don't forget, I still exist. Mm. Hi, guys. So, um, <laughs> I'm still alive. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, I, I would say it's, a, it's about a lot more than just marks. 
Okay, thank you for that. And then somebody, you, okay, you already asked, you answered this question, is the workload for masters hectic? So then let me just move on to the second part of someone's question, which is, is it possible to balance being a registered counselor and a master's student? Registered counselor meaning you're working. <laughs> um, yeah. Is it possible? <sighs> sure. <laughs> I think <laughs> barely. Look, it's like if you apply yourself very intensely and be like, I'm going to do both, uh, you might just be able to pull it off. But uh, to be honest, I'm not seeing how you're going to pull off practicing full time while being a master's student. Because I think for a lot of people, that's why I mentioned, um, I'm not even sure if master's programs allow you to work while you're doing the program as well. I think we were all told, whatever you're doing, quit. Yeah, even in the application forms. It tells you you will not be able to hold a part-time job while doing this degree program. Yeah. So to be honest, you really won't. You you honestly really won't. Um, because I also came into this as a registered counselor, and I can't tell you the last time I did anything registered counselor related. <laughs> the moment masters entered my life, it it's been masters. So um, what I would advise for them is. Perhaps maintain your registration as a counselor until your registration as a psychologist is secure, just to make sure you have yeah. access to that industry if when it's still needed. Um, but definitely, I would lean more towards it's not possible. Okay, thank you for answering that. And then somebody asked, is it true that you are interviewed as a master's student to see how intensely you can handle a situation during a session. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not just about even interviews, because uh, remember we, for example, we do uh, during training we do role plays, right? So even mm. during the role play, they're gonna see how you're responding to certain things, right? Um, we have feedback with a supervisor every week. And during that feedback, you're sending them notes on what happened in the session. You're, um, you're getting feedback consistently in terms of, okay, this is what I'm seeing. This is the areas where you've developed. This is the area that still needs development. You could do better in terms of your theoretical conceptualization. You could do better in terms of, you know, ABC, da, 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 da. So your ability to handle several areas is continuously being assessed. And it's for your own benefit. So I think it's a good thing. Yeah. Thing. Yeah, so it's it's not always so formal as to say we're scheduling a meeting to discuss your ability to do A, B, C, D, but just understand that you are continuously being assessed, whether it's how you interact in class, whether it's how your supervisor experiences you during um, uh, during supervision, um, both on-site and off-site supervisor, on-site being the, uh, the university supervisor and off-site being uh sorry off-site being the university supervisor and on-site being the supervisor at the hospital during practicals so you're constantly being assessed and constantly being informed on how well you're handling the stress from how they perceive it sometimes they'll be like sometimes they'll call you in and be like Yo, you seem to be struggling are you okay <laughs> um yeah. would you say it's supportive more than like evaluative like it is during the selections like selections it's very you know, evaluates are very pressured. Would you say during masters, it's more supportive? Yeah, um, but then, uh, then again, it also high, highly relates to, or highly depends on how you relate to your supervisor, because there are some. Um, this is where the human relations aspects comes in now, because for example, the way in which your supervisor wants to offer support may not be the way in which you feel the most supported. <laughs> right so you might have a supervisor who believes in hard love and being like just coming down on you and telling you that was complete nonsense and if you're not able oh, to sit with that it's like, you know um i remember this one time i went for supervision my supervisor was just like i don't know what the hell you did <laughs> but that was not psychotherapy and i'm like what did i do <laughs> like, oh, okay. at best, like at best you just had a conversation with that person that was nonsense and i'm just like oh my goodness <laughs> <laughs> yeah so wow. uh that that depends on how you relate to the person and how they relate to you um if you experience their approach to you as challenging then you're not gonna find it supportive naturally but what i will say is their intention um from my experience is always to support you 
Because they do want you to succeed. Yeah. They do want you to succeed. But whether you experience that as supportive or not, it really depends on some of the intangibles. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for answering that. It's interesting to see how the different subfields answer that question. So, um, the next question is, what is one thing you wish you knew or did before starting the Masters? Wish I knew. Look, as I mentioned earlier... Or um, I wish you knew or did. Yeah. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, I had a mentor. So, I'm not sure I came into this with anything I wish I knew I, or did, to be honest. Um, mostly because I was informed of everything coming in. Um, but I think for a lot of people... What they often say they wish they knew was how competitive it is to get in. Um, mm. And how there is just no guarantee. No matter how high yeah. your grades are, there's just no guarantee and you often need a backup plan. Um, as I mentioned, I was fortunate to have been informed. So I came in with a backup plan and I came in with that knowledge. Um, and I knew everything that I was risking and I guess I was arrogant enough to risk it. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, so I can't think of anything where I'd say, I wish I definitely knew that. But I think that's the area that often is then highlighted where people say, I did all of this. I invested four years of my life up to honors and I just didn't know what the hell I was walking into. Yeah, you were fortunate enough to have a mentor. So maybe um, if you could like find like to the people now, if you could find a mentor, then that would be highly advisable so that they can inform you of things to do or what to know before starting definitely find a mentor i think something that's uh, been really dope lately is i think you're very familiar with them as well the emergence of Co cognition and co uh the student mm. psychology network on instagram um one of my yeah. friends works uh quite um consistently with them and i think what they're doing is amazing because this field was very mysterious to a lot of us uh, to a lot of people mm. coming in and i think they're really helping clear that up and uh, they can then take on the role of that mentor if you can't find one within your communal spaces i think you can then look online and see what that is so though i don't have anything i wish i knew what i would highly advise is get a mentor get someone to teach you get someone to advise you sort of like you're also trying to do with these videos Okay, yeah. that kind of answers the next question, which is one, what is one piece of advice you would give to someone wanting to do clinical psychology? So do you have like another piece of advice outside of trying to get a mentor? One piece of advice? I think that's the main one. Um, going to find someone to walk with you through this journey. It's like the, it's like the, the, the number one. But one piece of advice for someone wanting to do my degree you know, let me not, let me not go personal advice. This this has to do more with practical. But I said this earlier. I'm going to say it again because I think it's more relevant to this context. But definitely get exposure. Right, get some exposure and understand what clinical psychology actually really is, because it's very romanticized. Right, it's very romanticized, and a lot of people walk into it with the romanticized idea of what psychology is. And truth is, and I'm not sure people, a lot of people talk about this, but psychology as an industry struggles to retain some of its uh, skilled populace, skilled individuals, because of this. Because people come in and they realize this is not what I want to do with the, for the rest of my life. So even after getting their master's degree, honestly, some leave the field, and they go yeah. do something else. Yeah, How does that work? Uh, they just realize this is not rewarding for me. <laughs> you know, I would rather go do something else. Because the thing with a clinical psychology degree, for example, you might, you, you gain access to several industries. So they'll be like, yo, you know what? I'm going to go corporate. I have no interest in working in hospital settings, for example. Whereas that was the primary purpose of a clinical psychology degree. You know, mm. so I would say walk into this with your eyes open and as informed as possible. Because I don't want anyone walking into this with a romanticized idea of the field and the industry and then being just utterly disappointed when they find that it's not yeah. as they imagined. And taking someone's space that has an idea or the proper idea of what it is, but they didn't get in for whatever reason. And now you, you kind of took that spot, but now you don't want it. And as you know, yeah. it's, it's a highly coveted, like so many people get rejected year after year. 
for this degree program so to to kind of hear that people walk out afterwards because they weren't fully aware of what it takes from you is is quite hectic it's hectic actually one of them was my was someone that taught us a seminar well they didn't leave the field entirely it's just that i guess they had time they did clinical psychology realized they wanted to be involved in another aspect and then went and did psychiatry sometimes you have to learn these lessons i mean everyone is on their own journey but like going back to the piece of advice you gave like do your research and not just reading journal articles like hit up a clinical psychologist in your area or hit up a few go on to forums sign up on sisa's um the psychological society of south africa's clinical psychology division they do a lot of things there i mean i volunteer within sisa's student division and there is so much information that not a lot of people are actually tapping into and that's just one example of doing your proper research before you enter the field and i think knowing the field itself and what is still to be done and everything also helps a lot in your interviews and actually getting into the program you know definitely it's it's really important guys i cannot emphasize that point enough <laughs> okay thank you and then on to the last question if you have a psychology degree but are unable to further your studies do you know of any jobs that one can branch into um well, so that depends when you say psychology degree do you mean bachelor's or honors i think maybe you can give like a scenario for each of them or maybe even both yeah cuz i think uh to be honest there are far more options if you have your honors right um <laughs> because with your honors you will then be able to tap into other areas which will unfortunately need more investment right um such as the primary one that everyone goes for is psychometry so it's like okay cool mm. let me let me go get the psychometry program and then i can become a professional psychometrist i think i only know of the uj program and the one at um nelson mandela university um no it's not very common yeah it's not very common so it's 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 a little hard to find if i'm being honest but that becomes an alternative path you can take and it 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 is a little expensive it is a little expensive but there are some that say they find ways into the program if they can afford it if they can't um a lot of the organizations such as JVR for example are also willing to work with people that are looking to get into psychometry as an industry you could also always talk to the um program coordinator if you get in they they might also be able to help you find uh, a funding program for it because they do also work in collaboration with these organizations so that's that's an outlet a possible one that you could try and then do you know of any jobs that like don't require any further studying but will take psychology graduates there's i've heard of a few um they're sort of heading towards the hr side of life mm -hmm. um they are usually interested in psychology students now naturally industrial psychology students do have an advantage here but they do also accept um a bachelor um honors in psychology students as well i know quite a few that have gone into this industry and uh for example i think one is working with standard bank if i recall and another with uh what's this organization i, I forgot its name so yeah um if i remember i might actually come back later and tell you but i i don't remember the name but it's within those fields where you're working with human relations they they usually quite keen on the skill set that um a psychology honors degree might give you with a bachelor's as i mentioned i'm not actually sure if there are many um i'm yet to come across that scenario so i think maybe that's one of the areas where that might need to be looked into as well unfortunately i haven't looked into it that deeply because i was mm. fortunate that the degree i did in my undergrad was already in honors so i never had to research what to do if you don't get it um uh, cuz i know mm. getting into honors itself can also be very competitive um yeah so there's some that might get stuck at that process for some time or might then decide to stop at that process and pursue other other opportunities mm. um with that one out high key advice looking into it i'm not familiar myself unfortunately Okay, thank you for that. I think that's everything. Would you like to add anything else before we end this? Sure. Um can I think of anything? 
because <laughs> I think what ended up happening is I talked so much in the beginning <laughs> that the right. earlier segments became a little lighter in terms of content I was throwing out there. No, I mean, I can't think of anything at this time that would be like massively important. Yeah, I think I've covered everything and I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to get repetitive on anyone. <laughs> Okay, if you do think of anything, we can always just put it in the comment section anyway. And then would you be okay with availing your email address if somebody wants to contact you, if they have any other questions, or do you just not have the capacity at the moment? Oh, no, it's perfectly fine. Um, <laughs> listen, I only made it this far because of an entire community of people helping me. How can I then decide, no, I'm not going to help anybody else. Like, I've done my part, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I just had to ask, you know, I don't want to be like, hey... Here's your email address for thousands of people to see. And, you know, you might get hundreds of emails or something like that. And you weren't really okay yeah. with that. No, you can you can give them my email address. You can give them my Instagram. Um, disclaimer. I don't know if how responsive I am on Instagram. But it might be an easier way to reach me than email because, you know, it feels less intimidating. I think there's just there's something about email that feels so formal. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that language. <laughs> That email language. Yeah, whereas Instagram, you just come in, hi, Gomez, and it's like, oh, hi. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. yeah, you can give them either one of my um, contact details, and that would be dope. Okay, yeah, this has been a really dope process, so thank you for having me, Lauren. Um, I will ensure that my contact details are available either in the comments section or in the description box. I can give it to Lauren, and she puts it there. I'm perfectly fine with anyone coming to contact me, um, answering any questions wherever I can. I'm no master, but perhaps what I know might be helpful to some people here and there. So, yeah, this has been really fun, and I hope everyone finds it really helpful. Also, disclaimer, I'm so sorry. I talk a lot. This might be very long. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put timestamps in the description box so that if somebody wants a specific question, then they can go straight to it. Awesome. All right, everyone. Um, this has been really fun. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I hope you find this really informative and enjoyable. But if not, hopefully down the line, it does, uh, that does change. So yeah, enjoy your day and good luck in your pursuit of the industry. <laughs> I wish you all luck. May the force be with you. Alrighty, everyone that is it from myself and gomez i really hope that you enjoyed this video it has been so incredibly insightful for me who's not even pursuing clinical psychology so i can only imagine how many people this video is going to help if you have found this video helpful please 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 give myself and gomez a, a thumbs up and leave a supportive comment for gomez in the comments section down below and if you need anything like i said his email is in the description box and the comments section that is it from myself and gomez thank you once again for watching don't forget to like and subscribe and hopefully i will see you in the next video bye